Greetings from London. This is Mariam Sharif and welcome to Star Models Podcast. Today I'm joined by a lovely guest who is an ex-British champion of bikini fitness. As you know, I'm on my journey of health and fitness myself and I love speaking to women who are in the fitness arena. So I welcome Krish uh, Kataria. Hi. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Yeah, I'm good. Very good, thank you. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. And so I am on my health and fitness journey for the last three months. And I've, uh, I have a personal trainer now. It really is something very unique when someone excels in something in health and fitness. I'm really intrigued uh, with your journey and uh, how you came about this. So firstly, can we explain to the audience what is an ex-British championship of bikini fitness? What is that whole title about? Can you explain what <laughs> yeah, that yeah. means in plain English for some people who are just starting their journey into fitness? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. maybe we want to inspire everybody else to get really fit and, and healthy. <laughs> Yeah, so b bikini fitness is uh, is a category of bodybuilding. Um, so obviously, you know, most of us know Arnold Schwarzenegger as the ultimate bodybuilder, yeah. and he is kind of who I guess made made bodybuilding into what it is and what we know today. Um, and then uh, within the bodybuilding industry, you can then compete in different categories. The same way, you know, if if you're uh, competing in athletics then you've got different sports right so uh, Arnold would have been in the largest category in the male category and then you have different levels um, right. where essentially you have less or more muscle right. and for women bikini fitness is let's call it the smallest category as in the smallest amount of muscle mm -hmm. uh, compared to some of the others uh, you know, and then from bikini fitness, you can go up to fitness and figure, et cetera, et cetera. And, and as you go up to those higher levels, those, those women, you know, have way more muscle than, than most normal men. Um, so, so bikini fitness is really the lowest category. But seeing, um, you know, South Asian women, Arab women, uh, taking part in the sport, uh, for me, that, it's, I feel quite proud as well because Ooh. I feel there's not enough representation. I did interview right. a lady called Zaina Heather a couple of years ago, 2019, uh, in Dubai, and who also is into bodybuilding. And you wouldn't find a, a you know a South Asian Pakistani uh, who was in in this field. Uh, so, what made you get into this? <laughs> Were you always quite sporty and uh, you know athletic? I, th I think, I mean, you know, sort of to, to answer that first part of the question about representation, I 100% I agree. You know, I've mm. never really had any role models that look like me in sport, in any of the sports that I've done. Mm. And, um, and, and I don't even think, you know, I think it's slowly changing, but it's, it's definitely not changing as fast as we want it to for women. Um, so I think, you know, genetically, we probably also kind of, grow up thinking that we just don't have the genetics to be amazing at sport absolutely um, yeah and um and so for me you know I'm 100% Indian genetically um so in theory I, I you know I by default don't have the genetics let's say to yeah. be sporty or or to do the things that I've done but I grew up in Sweden um, right. and and I think you know Swedish society has a completely different attitude towards mm. activity towards nature um, it's very accessible um, no one in Sweden ever made me feel that I was different because I was brown yes. they never made me feel different because I was a woman I you know so I, okay. I, I very much grew up in in a society where I, I guess you know my they it tapped into my potential mm. um, so where I grew up um, in this small town in Sweden when I was about three or four and I started making you know friends in the area all the kids that were sort of my age they were all boys so uh, you know they'd come and say hey Chris do you want to come play football with us in the park today and then the next day they'd come and ring my doorbell let's play inline hockey and the day after it was basketball and mm. in the winter we would be playing ice hockey and and all of those kind of things. So, um, so that's kind of how how it started, and then it just carried on in school. Um, and then I joined um, a, a football team 
uh, when I was about nine in Sweden. Okay. Um, and it was a mix. still team. quite unique, a woman joining or wanting to yeah. play football. It, it, yeah, but actually, was really it normal quite, in quite normal, normal normalized quite normal in Sweden? Yeah, yeah. You know, women's football has been a thing there for for years. Yes. You know, and uh, and fair enough. You know, the first team I joined was a mixed team because there weren't any girls' teams for nine year olds at that time. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, by the time I was sort of eleven, I was in a girls' team. Um, and and then carried on playing for that club until I joined the ladies team at 16. Um, and then, you know, played played sort of at, you know, two levels down from the Swedish Premier League, which, you know, wow. in today's terms would be kind of semi-pro. But back then, I sound really old now, but back then it wasn't, you know, there was... It, there was quite there remarkable. still isn't a lot of money in women's football but certainly it's it's only ever really in the very top leagues um yeah. and and so so that's kind of how how I got into sport and and you know it was football was kind of the one that I did the most of but really I think you know for me how I got into it was definitely because of because of growing up in Sweden and how yes. normal it was and and then I think looking back now, I probably, I have a lot of energy and I, I'm a better person for doing yes. sport and for getting rid of all that energy um, through physical activity as well. Um, and I think, you know, now if I look back, it, it definitely kept me out of trouble as well you know when you were a kid and yeah, when you were a teenager, focus, right something to, to have do. Yeah, yeah to have that thing that you know you 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 have you don't just turn up for yourself when you're part of a team you turn up for the team right yeah. so you have a responsibility towards you know 15 other players mm -hmm. and that isn't just when you play games it's it's also when you train and everyone commits a lot of time to it so you know, it certainly, you know, it, yeah, it kept me out of trouble, kept me focused, kept me, kept me serious, but also you have a lot of fun when you're part of a team as well. So what do you think you took from football into the bikini fitness? Did you, what did you learn? So there's a few things. I, I eventually quit football because of injuries. Right. And, and I kind of got to the point where I was like, at the end of the day, this is just a hobby. Like I'm never going to be playing football professionally. Right. And Do you think you, would you not recover from that injury, or was that something that made you re rethink the career? It was. It was just many little injuries that were sort oh. of annoying. And if, for example, in my final year of university, I was playing here in the UK, and I broke my nose I ended up getting head butted and got a massive egghead and nearly a concussion and um also got tackled to the point where my coccyx twisted and I was in you know really severe back pain and all of that happened in the same season and and I was oh. at final year of university and I was a bit like it's not it's not a you know it's, it's it doesn't really make sense to not be able to get out of bed and go to class when at the end of the day this is a hobby and 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 it's supposed right. to be fun right um so so I think you know in the end that when I when I quit football it was very sad because I lost a huge part of my personality mm. but your identity I, I guess yeah yeah yeah, yeah identity rather mm. and and that's when I started lifting weights in the gym oh, because okay. I could train around my injuries so if I had right. a bad back then I wouldn't squat heavy if I had you know bad knees then I'm not going to run on a treadmill I'm going right. to be on the cross trainer um, and that's really what got me into training in the gym and lifting weights and and I realized that I was quite good at lifting um, I turned up at this gym um, about 11 years ago um, and there was this man he was like 55 ex-special forces you know shaved okay. head and yeah shredded and he just looked at me and he was like you look like you can train do you want to come and train with me and I was oh, like interesting. go on then so I I did a session with him and he was like Chris no one's ever lasted a whole session with me you know and then and then from then on me and him trained together pretty much every morning at 6 a.m Monday to Friday for the next four years and, wow. and that's four years yeah that's wow. how I got into lifting weights 
right. and have that kind of structure. Um, yeah. And then it was kind of, at the, you know, after a few years of doing that, he kind of said, Chris, you know, you can compete. And I was like, oh, I don't know, like, I don't have the genetics and, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm a little bit um, chubby or not chubby, but I was, you know, I was, I was a bit more fluffy, let's call it. Uh, okay. And, and I, 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 after even four years of lifting, because, well, because what, what you don't, I mean, what you well, don't, there's a different realize, type of fitness level for bikini championships. Well, and, and that's the thing, a fit yeah. body is not necessarily mm. a, a sculpted body. Yes. You know, yes. You, you, marathon runners are way fitter than I am, but mm. you might prefer my body to a marathon runner's body. Right. So there's yeah. a huge difference between mm. aesthetics and actual physical fitness. Um, and I can definitely lift more now than I could when I was doing bikini fitness because mm-hmm. you're training you're you're training 12 sessions a week yeah but you're lifting quite low weights and doing high reps right so although it hurts physically Mm. the big the big thing is mental mental you know you you have to fight through hunger tiredness you know Mm. how do you keep up training 12 times a week doing a full-time job eating six meals a day weighing every meal you know I spent every Sunday and every Wednesday food prepping how is the relationship between body and food uh and how important is it and how important was it for you in this whole concept of training your body for for bikini fitness you know it's mind-blowing before you get into it you can never imagine what's gonna happen and 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 I guess, you know, I was the kind of person that before bodybuilding, my attitude towards food was like, it's functional. I just need to eat to function. Mm. And if I could take a pill instead of eating food, I would because I simply don't have the time or find it right. interesting. Um, and, and, and cooking the same. Um, but obviously that was not a great attitude. And I, and I learned that through bodybuilding, you know. Well, once I started eating uh, and following a bodybuilding meal plan, I realized that I could eat more than I was eating before volume wise. Right. But knowing where it was coming from and understanding macronutrients Mm. and, um, and picking the right sorts of calories as opposed to it's it's, sometimes it's not the amount of calories, but it's also the kind of calories that matter uh, makes a huge difference. So for example, if I was training 12 times a week, six six sessions of cardio mm. and six sessions of weights if in that week I didn't stick to my diet I wouldn't lose weight right yeah. so you can't out train diet yes I've learned that lesson recently with my trainer who's given me I've never weighed food the concept of weighing food didn't even enter my uh, my mind and it's so important um it, it's it's so important and I've been doing this and I've been learning this skill um and you know coming from South Asian background we have a very colorful palette and we have we love our food um and we enjoy our food it's a very social aspect to our life isn't it so that's a that that kind of learning and relearning and how the body works is really important and I think many like you said it's quite alien um, and anything to do with bodybuilding bikini fitness is quite an alien not subject. now I say the world is very different and the uh, the concept of really exploring your own gifts and talents is very different and not following the norm of accounting engineering and uh, you know mm. law but you actually have studied an MBA where did you fit that in <laughs> I don't know <laughs> You thought I'll just do an MBA at the same time. I did, I, I did that whilst I was whilst I was working full time and uh, doing my uh, final year of bodybuilding competition. Right. And that uh, that was the that was the beginning extra of extra mental stimulation. Yeah. <laughs> that was that was the beginning of the end of my bodybuilding career. Um, okay. No, joking aside, um, I. I didn't mean to be doing bodybuilding for as long as I did. Right. So I was meant to just do one competition and tick that box kind yeah. of thing. And how many um, did you do in the end? I did four years. I I right. I, I did my first one, won it, and qualified for the British Championships. 
So I was like, okay, let me go and tick that box as well. So I can say yeah. that I've been there. Um, and I turned up at the British and won the British in my second competition. So then the following year, I had qualified for the Europeans, for the world, for the Arnold Classics in America. So mm -hmm. all of this was sponsored and paid for. So of course I took the opportunity to do it and I probably did another 10 shows. Um, and that was way too much. I mean, gosh. Um, and then I tried to quit. And, and so part of my retirement plan from yeah. bodybuilding was to do the MBA. Right. Okay. Um, but I got bored. You know, it's a, that's the other thing. When you yeah. do something that intense. Yes. Um, number exactly. one, it's, you, you know, you're burning the candle because really no one can sustain mm. that lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then number two, when you try to get out of it, you're, you're you're empty like you've got you've got this hole to fill and yes and it's such exhilaration isn't it and then yeah. all of a sudden you're back to doing normal things I guess yeah and, competition and, is always on the go and your excitement and the adrenaline the next and, goal and the next one so yeah. yeah yeah but I would say you know I learned so much from all of that experience and, yeah. and you know one thing that I would say to you as part of your fitness journey is mm. that you know winning is doing something that you can maintain for the mm. next 20 30 40 years yes that is the definition of winning we we just don't know it sometimes you know I right. certainly didn't know it when I started mm. bodybuilding I thought winning was coming first in this competition and then right you know coming fourth in the Arnold's or trying mm. to win the world actually you know that isn't winning because at the end of it you know I couldn't sustain what I was doing it was a hobby at the end of the day and mm. it becomes quite unhealthy you become obsessed with food Yes. Because training your body to eat every three hours, um, the food is so clean that my I started craving things that I had never craved before. Like I right. never, I I would never order dessert. If oh, I right. did order dessert, it would be cheese. Right. But after a few months of bodybuilding, I was like chocolate brownies, cookies, peanut. Oh, right. Butter. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd wake up at 4 a.m. starving and just go on like Instagram looking at hashtag food porn and <laughs> anything that was sort of gooey and, yeah. you know. So I'd be did, there just, when you stopped, did your body completely change and your, like, obviously your diets change, your, your yeah. trainings change, your intensities change. So you yeah. put on weight and how did you feel yeah. with your body after that? Not great. <laughs> yeah. Not great. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, no yeah, I mean, I was almost forced to quit. I had pushed myself so hard that I eventually crashed out, and um, okay, and and it was kind of in the beginning. I got into it because I loved lifting weights, and yes. and you know it going to the gym was my meditation it was my me time and mm -hmm. and all of that stuff I didn't mind the sacrifices at all but then towards the end it it's quite a heavy burden to carry when when you play football it's mm -hmm. the amount of goals that the team score but when you lose a bodybuilding competition or don't place it's you it's yeah. how you look how you move how you behave how charming you are mm -hmm. and so when the product is you you take it very personally and it's very heavy to carry and it, when it's how you look you eventually just you're in the gym all the time surrounded by mirrors mm -hmm. and all you see is what you need to improve and so I had no idea I had I didn't appreciate any anything that I had achieved aesthetically I yeah. just saw what I didn't have so how did you overcome that that lowest point then I actually How did you come I, out of it? yeah it took me a couple of years mm. um and um and I had you know really bad body image I had problems with binge eating as well because mm. I'd kind of been on a restricted is that diet a, is a that long. a post effect is like that is that a kind of it's a side effect common. yeah, yeah it's mm. quite common um especially for women to get 
you know, when yeah. they come out of bodybuilding, because as you say, we, you know, we start craving things that we've never craved before. And yeah. you're taking your body fat percentage down to a natural level. Mm. Um, but yeah, so I, I, the thing that actually helped me get out of all of this in the end yeah. was, was therapy. So I actually did right what's called EMDR therapy when I got out of it and uh, EMDR actually is a, is a trauma type therapy that was right used I haven't to, heard um, of it so yeah do you want it, to explain it, it, it was used it was actually used to treat post-traumatic stress right okay. um and so it was invented sort of uh, by the American military um right okay and so that I happen to know someone that um did that kind of therapy and she right. kind of said to me I just said look I I have this massive issue I spent all day long just thinking about food mm. and I I'm eating uncontrollably and I feel awful uh, yeah. no one feels great for for eating uncontrollably and also yeah. I'm putting on weight and 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 you know I'm not I'm not in a good place and and actually for someone who has the discipline to train 12 times a week and become yes. a British champion, I actually feel out of control, right? Right, yeah. Um, and, um, and I realized that this is so normal. And, um, and, and I think, you know, when I did bodybuilding in 20, or started in 2015, it became really popular. And we just right. didn't know. We didn't know what good looked like and how to do these things responsibly. Yes and 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 you know how important mental health is in all of this and 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 even social media you know it, it's really taken off in the last seven to eight years so yes, yes. even even that is like to be to remain sort of awake enough to kind of realize that what you see on social isn't real yeah it's you know it's literally just the highlights of someone's life it's affected so how is life now? Life, <laughs> what you well, to? yeah. So I mean, n now I eat what I want, and, yeah. and I don't feel guilty about what I yeah. eat, which is great. Um, and and I sort of, you know, look in the mirror and I kind of go, do you know what? I'm quite happy, and it's not because of how I look; it's because yeah. I have freedom. You know, I go out, I have a social life, I drink, mm. I eat, I sleep well sometimes sometimes I don't get enough sleep I train three times a week max but I literally train for fun I don't right. train, you know because I need to burn calories or because I need to look a certain way yeah I just train because after a long day at work my brain's tired what's going to make me feel good yes is to, you know go and go and do a boxing session or go and play a little bit of football or something like that and and that that whole balance is mm. is very liberating and it feels great to be free you know it's but, wonderful. Wonderful. but I think you know you never you, you you know there's still there's still little bits and bobs you know these things never quite go away so I'm I'm the kind of person that you know I won't, I won't go, I won't step on the scales because I don't want to know how much I weigh. Mm. I don't want to associate my value with a number on scale. Yes. And I think that you've kind of, you understood now, you know, kind of got to know who you are as well and how you, how life is. I think it's also, a, isn't that something that you had, like life experience, you've done that, now you've come out of it, you kind of see the other side, you see both spectrums. And you have this balance now, which is wonderful. And you don't appreciate what? balance until you've seen the extremes, right? And and I Exa think exactly, you really do have to go to the complete contrast, as I say. What advice would you give to anyone who wants to enter this mm. field, uh, of bodybuilding or or enter bikini championships? Like, would any advice for someone mm. who's listening? I mean, I I would say there's a, there's a couple of things. I think you know, pick a good coach. And someone mm. that has sort of credentials and also someone, they're not just a coach for your body. They also need to be your coach from a mental health perspective. Right. So, you know, if I was playing, if I'm playing football for England mm -hmm. then my coach isn't just training me in football, they're training me in everything that it means to be a team member, which includes right. my mental health. 
mm. and there shouldn't be any difference when you're training for a bodybuilding competition right so, okay. you know pick a coach that actually cares about the whole thing and cares mm. about you you are paying them at the end of the day yes you know anyone can put you on a starvation diet and get you on stage for what for a one-off but mm -hmm. you know you don't want to you want to make sure that that you get there in, a, in a healthy way you know yeah. I yeah, think so. Exactly. I think that's that's number and one. And where would you find someone to coach you if someone was looking? Is there any uh, a board or a uh, where would someone go? Would they go to their go to the gym? What, what could you advise or or direct? Um, you know, social is a great place to start. You know, okay. look, at, look at other competitors. Mm -hmm. um, they many of them coach themselves. Right. So they, they, you know, it's their business. They, they mm -hmm. probably started off as PTs, or as they've done well in bodybuilding, they've become right. Um, they become uh, coaches for bodybuilding competitions. I'd say as well, you know, in gyms and things, there's a lot of people like that. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say, you know, don't just talk to people who have coached, been coached by that person yes. as well. Get kind of sort of references, and and it's the same as with anything, you know. Um, we all have our personal preferences as well um, mm. and so and people have different coaching styles so yes. so I would I would say pick 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 one um, that you've sort of seen but also check their references and, and have conversations mm. with people that are coached by that person um, and I'd say the other thing is you know make sure if you do want to do a bodybuilding competition do it for the right reasons mm -hmm. so don't do it for everyone else yes do it for yourself you know I think a lot of a lot of the time we think that when I look like that I'm finally going to be happy yes and I can definitely tell you that even though I've had the perfect body yes I was kind of happy but I was yeah. also pretty much dead inside because yeah. I worked so hard to get there and I couldn't maintain it and yeah. so your I would if I could do it again I would have done it differently I would have done it in a way that I appreciated what I was doing mm -hmm. and it wasn't based on how I looked it should be on how you feel about how you look yes many learnings there then yeah yeah for sure what would you like to be doing in five years time then where do you see yourself um I think for me so I sort of have a, a kind of normal corporate job and yes. probably what I would like to do is combine sort of my passion for business with my uh, passion for sport. So mm -hmm. I think there's so many things that we learn from competitive sport that can be applied. applied to business. And even more so now in today's businesses, you know, we care a lot more about well-being and mental mm -hmm. health and purpose and um all those kind of things and and I think you know it's very conducive to how you would build a sports team you know it's very yes. conducive to how England women have been building what they've been building for the last 10 years in football mm. to eventually you know win the Euros it's not a team of individuals it's actually a team of you know 15 players that have done something really extraordinary um yes. so I think you know for me that would be really interesting and and try and get more people like us yeah. in the sport and get, you know, maybe, you know, increase awareness of people like us, you know. You don't have to be, it, it's not attainable to try and be Usain Bolt, but mm. it, it is attainable to do what I did and what you're doing, you know, we're normal yeah. people. Maybe a lack of awareness and education, <laughs> you know, and, and exactly like role models. When you were growing up or through your journey, who inspired you? Who did you look up to? I don't know. Honestly, like I, I actually don't know. Because mm -hmm. if I think about it, there was no one. There was no There's one. There was no one, looked, yeah. There was no one no. that looked like me. If I, you yeah. know, if we think about women's football. Again. The girl from Bend It Like Beckham. It was the biggest female football star we've had and she wasn't even real. I'm trying to think somebody and I can't. I can't think of anyone. They're few and far behind. And I think the problem is when, when they are few and far behind, then 
what we really need to do is for young girls that are between five and 15 to want to get into sport. Yes. And they're not going to want to get into sport just because they saw one girl who made yes. it out of millions. Yes. But if they see several girls who are doing kind of what we're doing, then yeah. then that's like, okay, this is normal. It's not, yes. you know, I don't have to be, you know, that one in a million to do it. Yes. Get into physical activity. And if they do, they are going to be so much better, so much stronger, so much more confident. Yes. They are going to do better in life. The side effects are so... Um helpful in in adult life in life in general you know like you said mindset you know awareness I, I work you know the company I work for is like you know I'm not I'm, I'm the only woman in the room all the time and I couldn't do that job if I hadn't played football but because I play football and I've played football with boys and and men yes. and you know I've played in mixed teams where I've won man of the match <laughs> well and, done and and you go so but but because I've done that yeah. I can I can walk in to yeah. the office or a boardroom and even yes. if I'm the only woman I don't I don't it doesn't bother me yes but I but I don't think everyone feels that way and I think if other young girls can mm -hmm. feel that empowered simply by having experienced equality through sport mm. then uh, yeah then then you can really make a positive impact. Yeah, my mother used to play netball and she was known for sports. So shot put, javelin, and she's always played, she'd been, she was represent Pakistan for netball. Wow. The interest for me in sports, okay, I do watch it more than I play it, but uh, you know, tennis and understanding, you know, I, even cricket, she's a big cricket fan, but just uh, the love of sport, and I was having a conversation with somebody. I was like, aren't you watching the tennis? And, you know, I kind of was giving everybody the update for Wimbledon or the cricket that's on. And they're like, you're in sports. And I was like, yeah, well, because my mother, you know, you have to be influenced by maybe those around you as well. Mm. For me, my mother's a great inspiration, you know, in, in her she career. She sounds like she's ahead of her time, eh? Uh, again, I think also... Uh, family was very well aware and educated and so they were you know given opportunities you know so I think that also is um they understood that if someone had a skill or somebody has an interest you know let her do it you know <laughs> she wasn't academic as such but all of my other aunties are masters and my mother went into sport so I also feel that that is such a um you know, that's an encouragement, you know, that's where you would get empowered because you have mothers or sisters or other yeah. people that are, are enjoying it. Even I'd love to lift weights, you know, I'm trying, I will get there one day, but it's a journey, isn't it? It's just, a, for me, it's like a personal pursuit, you know? Yeah. So what is so, your, what is your fitness goal? My fitness goal, well, I've got an up coming up, but I will, I have to firstly weight loss, but I've got great energy and stamina so I I've always had that I have to enjoy everything that I do and if it's not made fun or enjoyable I'm not going to do it like I am the forest gump of walking I do love walking I come from the countryside so you know walk endlessly so again culturally you know brought up in the countryside very much aware of uh, the outdoors outdoor oh, yeah. sports you know from uh, horse riding to croquet, you know, a very complete difference. So I think it's, again, awareness, you know, making women, uh, females aware of uh, of understanding your body. I think that's the most important, you know, mm. the relationship that you have with your own body and how you can excel, you know, and take it to a different, completely different level. Well, yeah, we are, we are, our bodies are capable of a lot. Mm. Absolutely. And our minds are too, you know, and, and, and definitely I think, I think um, doing sport can, can just make us realize what we're capable of. And that sort of yeah. creates that butterfly effect across yeah. your life, you know? So, you know, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Um, is there any last words that you'd like to share with the audience? Two things. I would say, trust yourself. Yes. Um, and 
make mistakes, like fail and fail fast. And the earlier you fail, the better, because there is no such thing as failures, right? All, all it is, is the lessons that you learn. And, yes. and I wish that I had had the courage to make more mistakes and do, you know, mm. mess up a few more times yeah. and, and a bit earlier than, than, than I did um because those lessons are, are so so valuable um, yes and and we really should embrace them and and not be scared of them yes exactly so more courage yeah courage and conviction well thank you thank you so much I wish you well in what you do and uh I hope to you know see and encourage much more many women from the South Asian and Arab backgrounds coming into kind of sports, fitness, if not bikini championships, but at least to, to have that awareness of being in control of their bodies and minds, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Krish. Thank you. I uh, wish you well and I'll see you soon. See you soon. Bye-bye.